Welcome today to our third technical webinar. Uh, so we've had two before this, the first one, um, well, really three webinars if you count the initial launch, um, which was on August 8th. We're about two months in now, and this is our third technical webinar. Today, we're going to be talking about how do you build a successful application? So we're right in the middle of the open application period. We're accepting all those great ideas that you have, um, helping people with their applications. And right now, we're going to talk about the evaluation criteria, um, what you need to do, and what kind of information you need to be putting into that application to really have the best shot at moving on to the next phase. And I've got some bad news today. Um, I'll be here, but my um, partner in crime, Caressa Wen, um, who I know there's a lot of fans of her out there, she won't be joining today. Uh, her tribe is having a groundbreaking ceremony uh, for a new project. And so she won't be joining, but she will be at the next one, which will be um, announcing soon. And so look out for that uh, on the listserv. But moving on, let's talk about the timeline of the Fire Grand Challenge. This is just a little bit of a reminder for you. As I said, we're right in the middle of this open application period here. So we've got about a month and a week left in the period, um, which is plenty of time to get that application in. Um, right now, we're here to support you, and then we're going to be moving on into the evaluation and matchmaking phase on December 2nd, which is that deadline, and that's the date to remember. So with the evaluation period, we're going to have a third-party panel of judges judging the applications. Um, so with the technical applications, each one will be judged three or four times by a, a judge, and our judges are going to consist of technical experts from across the fire and forestry field. Um, so these will be people with expertise in post-fire restoration, pre-fire restoration, mechanical thinning, and stewardship economies, um, people with uh, expertise on innovation in general, on the scaling startups, on all different practices. And we'll be pulling in more judges, too, as we see your applications and see what kind of expertise is needed for them. And so I think it'll be a really interesting opportunity to get some good feedback on your ideas as well. And so after that, we're going to be moving into the matchmaking period where technical applicants who had that initial idea at partner communities, um, the highest achieving of both of them will be able to go into this matchmaking event to rank each other, to explain their needs to each other and form an innovator team that is composed of both a technical applicant and a partner community um, to really make sure that you have expertise from both sides of those different um, areas. And so after that, the, the top six um, slots uh, or innovator teams will be moving into the acceleration and field testing portion, where each team will be given $50,000 split between the two parties um, to carry out field testing and to participate in accelerator programming. And so I'll talk more about the benefits of this program. Um, I'll talk more about um, the evaluation period during this period, but I just want to remind you all of what the timeline is looking like. And so that field testing acceleration period is going to be about nine months stretching from early March until November when we'll have the grand prize ceremony and announce the final two winners. And so that's something to, to keep in mind as you look forward to the next year. So as I mentioned, there are two ways to apply. Um, this webinar is mainly geared towards you technical applicants and technical applicants are the ones with the initial idea or for the solution or innovation. So that could be a new tool, technology or process. I'll talk more about that later as well. Um, so the bulk of this session is gonna be for technical applicants. But if you're interested in being a partner community, I'll talk a little bit about at the end of how you apply as well, um, which is a separate form. And also it may be interesting um, for you to stay on for this webinar and to see, okay, what are the technical applications gonna look like? Um, what are the potential innovations being judged on? Um, and to get some of the background there. So um, I think it'll be a really informative and fun webinar anyway. So, uh, and also to that end, um, we're gonna put in the chat um, some links of where you can apply for each of these. And uh, if you go to the website, there's links to the handbook, there's links to um, both the application forms, whether you want to be a technical applicant or a partner community. And I'll say as well, if you're not sure, reach out to us. Also, it is not mutually exclusive to apply for both of them. So if you are a community that has an idea and you want to be considered as a technical applicant, um, you can apply. But if you also are thinking maybe it would be better um, just to be a, to be a partner community and to help with that co-development and that field testing, you can also fill out that interest form. It's it's a short form. It's not going to take you too much time. So um, there really are both paths open for you. But now to get to the, the bulk of the webinar here. So we are going to be talking about evaluation criteria for technical applicants. And so this is the criteria that the judges are going to be judging on. Um, so this is all in the handbook, um, which I'll tell you about in a second. 
Um, but I really want you to pay close attention to these criteria um, because these aren't just the guidelines. These are the literal, this is the literal rubric of how your application is going to be judged. And so this is how they're going to be scored. This is going to be what determines whether you move on to the next round. And so really try to pay close attention to how your innovation fits um, with these different categories. And also just be careful or be pay close, pay, pay close attention to um, as well the answers that you're giving and make sure that you're you're framing the information in terms of these, these categories as well, because um, you could have an innovation that fits really well, um, but if you don't really construe to the judges why it fits these different categories and why it has these different benefits, then you may not move to the next round, which would be a shame because we're doing this whole program to help support you and your innovations. And so let's get into them. I'm going to go down each one, and then we're going to have time at the end for questions as well, um, where my teammates and I will be fielding any questions you have. So please feel free to put those in the Q&A right now, and we can get to them live here, um, or we can answer them in real time at the end as well. So um, reach out with those questions. But before launching into the the individual criteria, I, I just want to say once again, and I'll say this at the end too, check out the Innovators Handbook. Um, this is a document that we, we worked hard on to lay out the challenge rules, to lay out the criteria. Um, this has all the information that you need for a good application. Um, and so please, Play, pay close attention to this. I guess that's saying uh, play close attention. It's stuck in my mind now, but um, the handbook has detailed information on the background of the challenge, um, a little bit more information on the fire crisis, eligibility, how to apply. It's got everything you need. So check out that document, have it ready, have it open in a separate tab when you're working on your application and refer to it because um, I think it could be a big help to you. And uh, that's the best tip we can give you on how to be successful during this open application period. Look at the handbook. So now starting with the individual criteria, the first criteria is fit to the challenge themes. So we've designed these themes with the help of um, a working group of um, stakeholders and rights holders, leading experts from across Western North America. Uh, and they helped us come up with these themes, um, which fit to the different gaps within the solutions to the fire crisis today. And so we designed these themes very carefully and to try to address and uh, these different uh, issues on the ground, and to try to make sure that the solutions that are supported by the challenge have the greatest impact possible on this current crisis. And so we want you in the application to demonstrate that you have a thorough understanding of the themes and that you are working to address them. And so the innovation should align with the challenge goals and address at least one of the two themes, which are scaling ecosystem stewardship and synthesizing diverse knowledge. All right, you might ask, what do those themes really mean? Uh, they are pretty broad. They encompass a lot. That gives you a lot of room to maneuver as an innovator because there are so many issues to address within the fire crisis. And the good news is if you have that question, we have answered it in, in pretty strong detail in the fire crisis and challenge themes webinar. You may have watched that, um, which was Caressa and I and a really amazing panel with Shafali, Saraya, and Cole um, from multiple different groups talking about what are the themes? What are we trying to address? What are some of the core problems in the field right now? So I encourage you to go back and check out that webinar. Uh, my teammate um, will be putting the, the link to that webinar in the chat, so you can go check that out. I think it's also linked on the webinar or on the, the website as well. Um, but we go through the themes and break those down. Um, because I like you guys so much, I'm going to give you just a little bit more information on those right now, um, just in case you don't have time to go back to the webinar. You'll get at least a little bit more information right here, and you can look at the handbook too. But just to kind of reiterate, what the theme, main kind of challenge topic is and what the two themes are. Um, the challenge goal is trying to transform how we live with and manage fire by accelerating and scaling solutions that bring together indigenous, rural, and place-based knowledge with technology and other forms of innovation. And so we're trying to bring together these different spheres of the field um, where we're seeing solutions emerging, but not seeing too much interchange between them, not seeing enough uptake of them, enough attention and resources going to them. And so that's the central theme. And then the sub themes are one, scaling ecosystem stewardship. Um, so this is trying to incentivize and scale locally appropriate, economically viable stewardship of land and fire throughout the fire cycle. And so we want um, pre-fire treatments. These could be beneficial fire, cultural and prescribed fire. Um, they could be mechanical forest treatments, um, ways to really re help restore forest health at the landscape scale, often before fires. Um, we want to be we want solutions that are supporting stewardship economies um, that help create those economic returns that can feed into that stewardship of the larger ecosystem. 
and also post-fire restoration. Um, so addressing those growing restoration backlogs where we're seeing over 8 million acres of um, land needing post-fire restoration on the Forest Service lands, uh, national forest lands, uh, and then just much broader areas that are that are emerging every year as destructive fires spread across the Western United States, Western Canada, and Mexico. And so trying to address those growing restoration backlogs that could be the creating seedling pipelines, um, bringing down the cost of actually doing those large scale plantings. So there's a lot of different areas within the stewardship realm where your innovations could fit. And so that is the theme one. Theme two, we're looking at, um, and I, I messed up the titles of this on the first webinar and I've done it again now just to try to be consistent for you all there, but this should say synthesizing diverse knowledge. Um, how can we promote tra transparency and bring together different types of knowledge or data within the field? Um, so how can we translate data into actionable information for all stages of the fire cycle? How can we promote information flows and make sure that that information that's created um, is actually making its way to the practitioners who need it um, in remote locations and crisis scenarios? Um, how can we support situ situational awareness for destructive fires, but also for proactive fire management and beneficial fire? And how can we understand and incorporate implications of future conditions and changes into current environmental conditions into our response to fire? And so there's a lot of different areas within here. Um, and once again, um, I haven't included all the bullets from that first webinar, but there's a ton more information on um, how can we re recapture um, cultural fire knowledge? Um, how can we recover that that's been lost after um, generations of trauma and, and concerted effort to stamp that out over the last century? Um, and so there's a lot of different ways that you could tackle this theme too. It has a lot of overlap with theme one to stewardship. And so um, we've really presented um, some, some wide areas that you can try to tackle with your innovations. Um, but once again, we, we did design these to, to try to address some of those core problems that we see in the field right now. And so... I will say um, a lot of these, a, a lot of the, the main theme, the main topic, they, they deal with trying to bring together these different types of knowledge. Um, if you're only, if you're working on one side of, of those two different spheres, maybe you're working primarily um, with place-based knowledge, maybe you're working primarily more the technology and other forms of innovation side, that's okay. You know, don't feel like your innovation isn't relevant because of that, because we do have that matchmaking process where you will have the opportunity to form a team with a community partner or with a technical applicant, and you're gonna be able to, to access some of that other knowledge. And so um, please you know, don't rule yourself out uh, because your innovation is appreciated. And also if you have questions about it, you can always reach out to us. I'll talk more about that later. Now, criteria, criteria two, uh, innovation. And we want it to be innovative and transformative. Uh, and so right off the bat, you're gonna see up here that this is 20 points. Um, so the first one was 10 points. Most of the other ones are 10 points. There's one other one that's 20 points as well, but this is one of the top two highest weighted uh, criteria that we have. And so your innovation, we, um, in your answers, you're going to want to express why is this innovative? Why is this a true innovation within the field? And also how is it tra transformative for the field as well? Um, so it's not just new, but it actually does have the ability to make a larger impact as well. And so we want innovations to be fundamentally different from those that are currently being deployed for fire management um, or that it substantially transforms existing approaches uh, by, for example, incorporating different knowledge or, or significantly updating it. And so when we talk about transformative as well, um, we want you to demonstrate how it has the potential to significantly impact some of those themes that I was talking about with the last criteria. So fire stewardship practices, um, large scale ecosystem restoration before and after fires, um, use of beneficial fire, mechanical treatments, um, other types of fire response during active fires. So um, how can we really move forward towards achieving those impacts? Um, and so think about these. Um, when we talk about what is an eligible innovation, uh, I do direct you again to the handbook where we talk about what is eligible. Um, it's an innovation. An innovation is considered for the purposes of this challenge, not totally in, in general with, we're, we're not saying this is what innovation is, this isn't. We're just talking about for this challenge, this is what's considered. Uh, it's a process tool approach or digital solution that has a functional prototype ready to be piloted. Um, and so it has to be something that is significantly updated. Um, it could be an ecosystem management practice. It could be a different type of equipment. It could be information or communication technologies. 
It could be a new production processing or distribution process um, relating to some of that stewardship economy and post-fire restoration work. So there's a lot of different ways. It doesn't just have to be something you can hold in your hands necessarily. Um, and we talk about has a functional prototype ready to be piloted um, as a, a part of that criteria, because when you are selected as a finalist, you will be moving into that field testing and acceleration period early next March. And so you got to have that prototype ready to hit the ground running, to work with your partner community that you paired up with um, to really start seeing how your, your innovation works on the ground and doing that initial validation. And so you do have to have that prototype ready. And so we are looking at innovations that are probably TRL technology readiness level three or beyond. Um, and so you're going to want to express that in your application that you are ready for that field testing period. Um, but only express it if you are truly ready. You know, we want you to to be, um, you know, to express your current state in the application. Um, now, what is not an eligible innovation? Uh, established solutions that are already fully developed and being extensively implemented. If you already have a, a nationally deployed solution um, that already has robust funding, um, then that will probably score you lower on the innovative and uh, transformative uh, criteria uh, because we are looking to support solutions that have that room to scale and expand their impact. Uh, purely policy solutions. Um, we're not considering innovations for the challenge. Um, they're extremely important within the space. Um, and we, we're working with our partners on supporting changes in policy, but they, they aren't really what this mechanism of the challenge is designed to address. Next is purely technical assistance, training, or capacity building programs. Um, that doesn't mean that it's not a huge benefit to have those as part of your innovation. For example, if you're developing some tools or or processes that help engage communities and provide them with information that can help them build capacity. But if you're just purely doing an educational program, um, then that won't quite count as an innovation. Um, same with a purely scientific research project. You do have to have that impact on the ground as well. And then limited term projects. We are looking for innovations that can scale up um, and really have that long term effect, um, which another criteria addresses as well. And so if you're just looking to do a nine month project and then finish it at the end, then um, this isn't quite the program to support what you're looking for. Now, criteria three, value proposition and feasibility. Um, this is once again, 10 points. So the standard amount of points. And so with this, we are looking of, does your innovation address a major pain point or provide significant benefit to users across Western North America that they would actually be willing to adopt? Um, so it doesn't just help them in theory, but they'd be willing to pay for it. They'd be willing to use it if it was made available to them. Um, they'd be willing to purchase subscriptions for it if that is the long-term model. And so you, you'll have to demonstrate in your application that there is a want and a need for this that people would actually utilize in the field. Sometimes there's great ideas, but maybe they're a little bit too complicated for people to actually implement them into their daily practices. And so for this, you also have to think about who your user is going to be. Uh, is your user communities? Is your user companies, uh, municipalities, private landowners? Is it federal land management agencies? Um, so you're going to have to express who your user is um, to, to show that not only will people be willing to adopt it, but there is a robust base of users as well. Um, next, the innovation is technically and logistically feasible um, with a clear understanding of potential risks. And so um, you have to show that this technology um, or process or approach, it actually does, it actually would work in the field. And so provide some evidence in that regard as well. And then next, we want to promote a locally appropriate community-centered fire and ecosystem management so that it does actually manage um, the ecosystem according to those eco-cultural values that are, that are valued by the local communities. And so I think that really fits into whether users would adopt it. If communities and, and other local actors are willing to adopt it, then you're going to be hitting this part as well. But just this criteria is all about showing that, A, um, you actually are addressing a problem that, that people are willing to, to use your solution to address the problem with, and uh, that it's also feasible um, to do so. Next is criteria four, adoption and scalability. Um, so not only will people adopt your, um, will users adopt your, your innovation, but there actually is an opportunity to scale it. And so given that we are talking about community-centered approaches, um, given that we're talking about supporting different local contexts across a really wide geographic area, all of Western North America, stretching from the boreal forests down to the much drier sky islands of Chihuahua and other states in Mexico, um, and further down as well into the tropical areas in Mexico, um, 
we really are um, looking for solutions that that can scale across this area. Um, it doesn't have to be um, scaling a one fit one solution fits all problems um, type solution across the entire area. Um, maybe it works in a community, and then that model could be replicated in other communities. Um, but it doesn't have to be replicated by by you, the solver. Um, maybe it's just pioneering an approach that could then be taken on by other communities. So um, don't worry, you don't have to be trying to build a a unicorn type company well, with your innovation that's going to scale across the entire continent. But we do want solutions that their impact can scale across large parts of the region. And so it can really be helping all these different fire regimes across the region. Um, and so to that end as well, uh, we want the innovation to be easily manufactured, distributed at scale um, to apply in different regions, not just very selective communities um, that have maybe um, specialized infrastructure or very um, preferred access to different mills or other types of infrastructure or um, urban areas. So it can't just work in very specialized conditions. Um, it has to have kind of a broader application as well for different contexts. And then also in the interest of scaling, um, you're gonna have to be looking at those economic benefits as well. Um, so, or ways that can actually encourage collaboration. And once again, that people are willing to adopt it and pay for it because it is that advantageous. So um, one of the, the best paths to scaling is through accessing those, those economic benefits for the users and um, for the beneficiaries. And so um, that is another way that you're really gonna be able to make a strong case for your innovation um, with this fourth criteria. All right, next is related to what I was just talking about at the end there, financial viability and long-term sustainability. Um, so you are gonna have to demonstrate that you have a clear pathway to financing your innovation over time, including revenue generation or other recurring funding. This doesn't mean, once again, just like how we have a broad definition of innovation, it's not just a tool. Um, this also can mean a clear pathway for financing. Your innovation can have multiple different ways of looking as well. So. Um, maybe your users are a couple of different larger scale users like federal land management agencies. Um, maybe um, your application or innovation actually would be relevant for VCs for venture capital funding and could be scaled larger. Uh, maybe it does have a um, subscription type model. Um, maybe it will just be continuing based off of grants, but it really is that necessary of work. And there is enough of a, a need out there that that that's a, a viable pathway. As long as you can demonstrate that your innovation will get the funding needed to be able to scale uh, in the long term and in a sustainable manner, that it won't be subject to, to rising and falling budgets with a lot of these different agencies or groups, um, then you're going to have a strong chance at, at getting the maximum points here. And so I think to that end, as I was uh, alluding to at the end of that um, response there, you have to be able to identify the risks and mitigation measures for long-term viability. So what are the risks to um, maybe three or four or five years down the line, um, will people still be willing to pay for it? Is there still um, funds that can support the scaling of this innovation or the use of it? Um, those are things that um, you have to think about in your your application. And that's because, as I said, you know we're looking to support innovations that can carry on. Um, we're looking to help launch your ventures, looking to help um, support your innovations over time. Uh, because as you can see in this photo, um, trees keep growing. The, the fire cycle keeps going. Post-fire becomes pre-fire. Um, these trees will likely have to be, be treated um, going forward. And so uh, the ecosystems will, will need stewardship. And so to that end, the innovations will have to, to keep carrying on and keep having that solving power going forward, which can only be made possible by having that financial viability and long-term sustainability. So that's something to think about in your application as well. And I'll just add a note as well. When you go and you look at the submittable form that you actually fill out your application on, um, it's going to be referring to, okay, this question relates to criteria five and criteria six, or this question relates to criteria two. Um, and so you're going to be able to think about, okay, when I'm answering this question, um, what are the judges going to be thinking about when they're reading it? Um, obviously, the judges are going to be taking into account the whole application with the scoring as well, um, but they will be certain questions on the application linked to specific criteria. So as I said, I think the best thing you can do is just have the handbook ready, um, look over some of the text that we've written under the criteria, look back to this video um, and think about, okay, the judges are gonna be thinking about these factors when they're reading these questions. So that's a good way to make sure that you're really matching up the information and making, making it as easy as possible for the judges um, to know, okay, your innovation's a winner. Now, criteria six, this is the other one I talked about that is 
20 points. Um, so 20 points out of 100, twice as much as some of the other ones. Um, and this is impact on biodiversity and nature. Um, so we really value communities, um, which are a core part of the ecosystems across the region. Um, and at the same time, our mission as Conservation X Labs is to address the underlying drivers of extinction. And so we really do place a high premium on trying to support biodiversity, prevent extinction, um, protect nature uh, across the target region. And so you're, you're going to want to prove that your innovation has tangible net positive impacts on biodiversity conservation and the ecosystems within the region, including forests, grasslands, chaparral, um, wetlands, all these different ecosystems. And so you're really going to want to make clear um, and go a little bit deeper than just, um, you know, I think given that we all here are concerned about the fire crisis, we all here are concerned about the state of um, Western North America's forests and ecosystems and communities, um, that I think it can sometimes feel like we don't really need to state how our innovations are going to be directly addressing um, the underlying problems and helping with these factors. Um, or it's going to, maybe you'll be tempted to, to know that, okay, they'll know this is important because they know it connects to, to conservation and they know that forests relate to, to climate and uh, to other factors and wildlife. But this is, with these questions in the application, this is going to be your chance to really show how exactly um, you're helping protect nature and biodiversity. And so you're going to really want to show in detail how your innovation is restoring and protecting ecosystems or how it's reducing the risk of damaging fires and how that affects the different biophysical variables, um, biophysical variables related to, to the ecosystems out west. And so um, you're going to want to identify and propose ways as well that you can avoid, minimize, or mitigate any significant negative effects um, in line with the mitigation hierarchy, which is linked in the handbook. And so um, every you know, action in the ecosystem, I probably don't need to explain to you all, but it has the potential for negative actions, especially given how complex the systems that we're dealing with. And so you're gonna to wanna to try to predict, okay, what are some of these potential and um, negative impacts of the innovation that I'm proposing? Um, because the judges will be thinking about those and it's best you, um, you just explain how those will be mitigated. And so kind of get ahead of those questions. And so once again, this is a very important criteria, 20 points. And it's a good opportunity to really show how you're going to be having that exact impact on the ground and what scale of impact is, is possible with your innovation. Next is the other form of impact, um, which I'd say the other form, but they're both so intertwined in these ecosystems um, that it's, it's not really fully otherized, but social and cultural effects. Um, so you're going to want to show that you have tangible net positive impacts on human well-being, their economic livelihoods, the cultural values uh, that they want to see managed for, um, and also the stewardship of ecocultural resources. And so um, to this end, you're gonna wanna be showing the, the exact impacts that you will be having on communities um, in Western North America. And also at the same time, um, we are working, you will be working with a partner community in that finalist stage. And so you're gonna have to show in this section as well, how you can respect and protect data sovereignty uh, for indigenous and other uh, rural communities or wooey communities and how you're gonna avoid negative effects um, on human well-being. So just as you gotta try to predict what are some of those potentially negative ecological effects, um, you're gonna wanna predict um, some of the potential negative effects on, on humans as well. And really show the benefits, um, show how you're minimizing as many risks as possible um, and showing how it's, it can also promote community engagement and supporting local actors. And so those are some of the, the values that they're really trying to encourage with this challenge. and so you're gonna to wanna to construe those in your, your answers as well. All right, and this brings us to our, our final criteria, um, team and community collaboration for 10 points. Um, so this is the opportunity for you to show off what makes you such a great team. Because when we give you that $50,000 um, finalist prize, that $50,000 finalist grant that you're gonna be sharing with the partner community, um, we're going to be supporting the innovation, but also supporting you, uh, because we really think that you have the possibility to be making a strong impact on the fire crisis, to be making that strong addition to the field and to the community of practice within it. Um, and we're going to be um, really doing a lot of work to try to plug you into that community of practice, connect you to technical experts, connect you to partners. I'll talk a little bit more about this later, but we're going to be betting on you and investing in you in that regard. And so this is a good opportunity for you to show um, how you and your team are motivated. You have the technical and business expertise to move this innovation forward 
and to, to make a strong contribution to the field. And so here's some of our team um, from the ideation sessions that I mentioned earlier. Um, so we want to hear about your team. And so you can help bring that to life for us. And we'll be really, really excited to meet you then in the finalist stage. And so we want to know that your team is capable and ready to meaningfully collaborate with local communities as well during that matchmaking process and during that field testing acceleration process as well. And so we've officially made it through the eight criteria. Um, I know filling out applications is not always the most fun, um, whether it's college applications, job applications, or exciting fire grant challenge applications. But um, we've tried to lay all this information out for you um, just to try to make it easy. Um, don't stress too much about it. You know, just give your, your best answer, best honest answer. Reach out to us for help as well. Um, because we're here to help. Um, as I said, we have a third party panel of judges. Um, we're gonna be bringing together anywhere from 50 to 70 judges. Each application is gonna be judged by three to four different judges. Um, so you're gonna have multiple different eyes on it. Uh, but one important factor of that is that myself and my teammates, we will not be judging. Um, we are just here to support you, um, here to help get you the resources you need to get through the open application period and then to support you in the later phases. So don't be worried about reaching out to us or um, that, you know, we're going to be trying to keep you at arm's length because we're judging you. Um, it's not true at all. We're here on your side. We're in your corner. So reach out to us at fireconservationxlabs.org um, if you want to reach the entire team um, or you can reach out to me personally. I put my um, official email here as well. So um, you and I are officially connected, so please reach out as well. Um, to that end as well, uh, if you have a question that maybe is a little bit deeper than an email or a host of questions, then you can also schedule a meeting with me in the Calendly link in the chat. And so we're going to be putting that link in the chat as well. Um, you can schedule a 15-minute meeting. You can ask if we can extend that to, to 30 minutes, um, but I'll be really excited to talk to you. And so please reach out to me. Um, this isn't a hollow gesture. You're not going to bother us. We're going to be really excited to be to be talking to you and, and to be helping you with your, your innovation in, in any way we can. And so we're really excited to see your applications and we're here to help you get over the finish line. So now I'd be remiss if I didn't once again, plug the innovators handbook. If you haven't downloaded it and you're already working on an application, please go back and download it. Please look at those criteria. Um, I'm saying please, but it's really it's it's to help you. And it's just going to make the application a lot clearer because you're going to have a better sense of, of what we're looking for. And if you're already here in this webinar listening to me, then you're already doing a really great job in terms of trying to seek out what kind of information that we're looking for. Now, as I said before, too, there are two way, main ways to engage in the innovation process with the Fire Grand Challenge. First is technical applicant um, with that idea for innovation. And we've been talking about that with all the different criteria but also you could be a partner community. And so how do you join as a partner community? Well, we actually have a Google form where you submit your, your expression of interest in being one. And so that form, um, I, I really don't think it's gonna take you much more than an hour or two. Um, that's even a, a conservative estimate. I think, you know, your community, you can get the information down pretty fast, um, but you're gonna be putting down some information about your contact information, um, who are the members of your working group? So who's the team? that's gonna be engaging with the matchmaking process and the field testing acceleration phase. Um, what are the interests of your community in terms of what are the threats you're facing? Um, what are the types of solutions you're interested in? Um, what are the impacts that you wanna see achieved or the ecocultural values that you're managing for? And then what is your community capacity? Um, so what kind of place-based knowledge um, have you developed within your community? Um, what are the your capacity for field testing? Um, do you have sites that could be field tested on that could benefit from these solutions? And so that's some of the information that you'll be giving. And once again, it is not mutually exclusive with the um, technical application and the expression of interest for partner communities. You can fill out both and you can reach out to us to figure out which category you fit in more. All right, and so I said I would circle back and talk a little bit more about the benefits of participating in the Fire Grand Challenge. If you're here for the third webinar, um, maybe you're already pretty hooked, you're already pretty excited about it, you don't need to know about it, but maybe it's exciting to hear it again. So I'm just gonna launch into it and, and give you a little bit of the spiel of why you should be participating as well. Um, first is that access to experts and leaders in the fire space. Um, over the last two years, we've been building a larger and larger community of practice um, with a lot of really impressive people within it that we're very excited to connect you to. Um, and during that field testing acceleration period, we're going to be evaluating your needs to scale your innovation and develop it 
and figuring out who you need to talk to. And so we're going to be connecting you to different communities, different technical peers. You're going to be learning with them through that process. Um, and also we're going to be connecting you to potential partners and other people who can benefit you. Um, next is field testing and technical validation. As you're trying to expand, as you're trying to seek that next tranche of funding, it's going to be helpful to have that on the ground validation and show that your innovation really does work. And it has our stamp of approval and the stamp of approval of our, our funders and partners too. So the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation, Esri, Planet, USAID, uh, and our partners, American Forest, Blue Forest, all of these amazing groups that have joined the coalition together. Next is mentorship and product and business development. Um, so a lot of people out there uh, maybe have a great idea, but you're a little bit new to the finance side or business side, or maybe you just need that extra support um, within that realm. Um, that's one of the main aspects that we're going to be helping develop um, with you during that field testing acceleration portion, which is, I think, a really great value add. Next is direct connections to potential users, scaling partners, and follow-on funders. Um, so really helping you to, uh, to make the case to users, um, really helping you to connect with them across Western North America, and really making sure that you have that follow-on funding after the challenge um, to continue your work and to achieve those impacts. Next is the prize funding. There's two rounds. There's that finalist grant of $50,000. And then we also do have the $100,000 grant prize at the end. And so there's multiple different ways um, to benefit from those prizes. Um, but, you know, I think people hear about, okay, there's a grant prize or there's a, a challenge. What are the prizes? We really want to emphasize as well all these other extra benefits that you'll gain from participating because the prize money is only one part of it. Um, it's an important part, um, but it's only one part. But we are excited to be able to offer those funds to you. And next is helping the ecosystems and the communities that we all love. And so we're all here uh, in part because we want to be doing the best we can for the communities and ecosystems of Western North America, all the amazing different landscapes and animals and people and, and um, the, the forests we love. And so I think, um, as I said before, we don't really have to to fully explain why we love them, but um, I think that's an important part to recognize as well. And a huge benefit of participating in the challenge is we're helping you reach that impact that you want to reach when you're developing your solution or innovation or working with your community. All right. And so that is the, the presentation that I have for you today. Um, we have about 20 minutes for questions. Uh, maybe we don't have that many questions in the chat. But I'll just remind you once again, um, the deadline to apply is December 2nd. Um, you have about a month and a week. Um, that's plenty of time to fill out the application. It's it's really not that burdensome, and we're here to help you if you do get stuck on certain parts of it, which I don't anticipate you will. But please reach out um, sooner rather than later. Um, you can reach out later too, um, but it's going to be a little bit easier for you if you reach out sooner. But once again, we're here to help you. I'll put my email in the chat. Um, and please, we're here to answer any questions that you may have. All right, let's see here. Checking out the questions. Chad, do we have any uh, any questions? No, I don't see any questions, but um, yeah, feel free to put them in the chat. Oh, something just popped up. Wyatt Troll um, is asking if to, to asking us to describe TRL three in a little bit more detail for the challenge. Yeah, um, so I could say a few sentences about that, and then Chad, do you want to talk about your experience from from previous challenges as well? Of course, yeah. Awesome. So with TRL three, we're really meaning that um, you are at least, and this when I say at least TRL three, I don't mean you have to be exactly TRL three. You could be TRL four, five, six. Um, and we can maybe put a, a link to that, that scale that, that NASA and other groups use. Um, but we're talking about technology readiness level of, of at least three. So you have that prototype that's ready to be tested in field sites. Um, and so you are able to hit the ground running, as I said, with the, the field testing um, portion, portion in March. And so maybe you're developing it right now. Maybe you already have a prototype. Maybe you already have the process hammered out enough that it can be implemented. Um, but you have to be ready to to be able to participate fully in the field testing acceleration portion. And you won't just be using that as time to develop that prototype. Yeah, I think that's a really important, um, a great question. And I think a really important point, um, we're looking for something that can get into the field, right? 
Um, so, so it can't just be an I- idea stage that you're still sort of putting together. It's got to be something that is is field deployable. And, um, you know, I think previous competitions that we've run like this, where we've run this, uh, what we call the collab model, where we take the the innovators, the technology providers, and partner them with the local communities or the, uh, you know, people that are actually going to be using those technologies. Um, it's really important to have something that it, you know actually exists in the world and isn't just sort of notional. So I think that's the the key component there for that that TRL level is just make sure that it's not just on paper or in your mind, but actually exists. Thanks, Ted. Got a couple more questions coming in. I'll read it. I'll read it for you really quick so you can kind of spend some time thinking about them. Um, awesome. So. Jeff's asking, what do we do if our technology is applicable in several ways, multiple applications, or can be worked out in the period where we are integrated with the with the community? We suppress fire with sound waves so we can use a handheld system for controlled uh, burn containment, mount to a drone for autonomous early fire response, or duct to protect structures. Interesting. Yeah, I think, um, you know, you're not going to hurt yourself by having more applications. Um, I mean, it really sounds like you're providing a a comprehensive solution to various parts of the the fire crisis and uh, destructive fire scenarios, and so and also with controlled burns as well, like you said. And so, I think that's great. And I think um, if it's different organizations working on these different technologies, then maybe you could have multiple applications. But otherwise, I think you could put it all into the same application and be explaining um, how it all fits together and and what your testing plan will be for the field testing acceleration period. And so. Um, if you have questions about um, how you want to frame your application, please reach out over email or with a meeting, and, and we'd be happy to talk to you about that. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Liam. Um, so Jonas is asking, um, as a startup with TRL 7 to 8, uh, I can monitor all areas in the immediate vicinity of power lines. Would the reach be big enough for this call? In this case, we cannot monitor areas outside of power grid structures, but we have comprehensive monitoring around power grid structures. Oh, cool. So you plug right into the power line um, or at least use the, that in existing infrastructure. That sounds like a really cool application. Sorry, like, I, no, I totally agree. <laughs> little, I totally agree. commentary here. That's great commentary. Yeah, please, Chad, always jump in with commentary. Um, I think that's that sounds like a great solution. Um, I mean, and as I was saying, too, um, and power lines are such a huge part of the landscape of, of so much of this region um, in all three countries and so many states. And so um, it's such a, a large part of um, the ignition of wildfires, especially across California. You know, I don't need to be explaining this to you, Jonas. Um, you sound like you're you're an expert in your own right. And so I think that's definitely applicable. Um, you're We're not asking for each solution to solve the entirety of the fire crisis or to, to be applicable in the entire region. Um, we just wanted to be able to make a significant impact that does help transform some aspect of how we're addressing the fire crisis. And so that sounds like it's kind of right in line with what we're looking for. And that's um, sounds like a great innovation. And so I think I can speak for, for Chad and myself and the rest of the team when we're say, uh, we're excited to see your application. So thank you very much, Jonas, for the, the question. Yes, please submit that. That sounds really cool. Um, so uh, Mark's asking if a technical applicant can be a multi-organizational team. Definitely. Yeah, definitely. Um, so one of the good things is that, um, you know, we don't have extremely restrictive funding um, from some certain uh, development organizations that have funded us in the past. And so um, we can be flexible with where the funds go to. Um, I think it really sounds like an interesting um, set up as well to have those multiple organizations, because then you're going to be bringing different expertise from each different party that's involved. And so that's one of the reasons we're doing the matchmaking process is because we want to be forming new partnerships. We want to be building that broader community of practice. And so if you're already doing that on the technical applicant side and you're bringing together different partners, um, then I think that's going to be a huge benefit and strength through application. Uh, and so I'd really encourage you as well to, to apply um, or if you have questions about um, what kind of setup you would want to do um, for the field testing acceleration period, then please feel free to, to reach out as well. And um, Chad, do you have anything to add to that uh, from previous challenges as I, well? No, I think that's exactly right. Like having a diverse team that can touch multiple aspects of your solution are, are experts in a multiple. I mean, I think that's a, a, a huge bonus actually. I, I, you know, not to say that we're doing this for this competition, but in previous competitions, we've actually created teams to, to kind of help build that sort of, you know, 
uh, ultimate uh, team that that covers all of the different aspects of, of the solution. So um, I think I think that would be really highly encouraged, actually. Yeah. Thanks for the question, James. Thanks so much, Mark. We really appreciate it. Thanks, Mark. Can't wait to see the uh, the innovation as well. This is, I don't know about you, Chad. This is getting me excited uh, hearing some I of know. the uh, Can we read some of these submissions? I know we've got a lot of really amazing judges too lined up um, from all over the field who are extremely excited to to see your innovations as well and to give their honest feedback and um, some some commentary as well that, that might be useful to you. So um, please, you know, once again, reach out to us. If you have any questions at all, you can ask more questions now. We'll stay on for another minute. Um, or you've got my email. Um, you can probably guess Chad's email from how my email's phrased if you want to bother <laughs> him too. You can't bother me. I, I love your questions. Um, but we're really excited to see all the applications you have. Chad, do you have any um, parting advice for them um, as they think about the application process, the next phases? Chad is a, a bona fide open innovation expert. So, <laughs> thanks for saying that, Liam. Yeah, well, I've I've been with the organization for um, almost seven years, and I've I've been involved with all of the challenges and programs that we've run. Um, I think Liam said it already. I'll underscore it. Um, it's something that we talk about all the time look at the criteria like that's the same criteria that the judges will be using to evaluate you as innovators so you know i stress this all the time just like read the innovators handbook we provide that it's basically the playbook for how to win the challenge use the criteria to make sure that you are addressing the things that we're concerned about and therefore the things that the judges will be you know using to evaluate your application so um i think like you know everything is there to 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 be to make you be successful just in terms of all of the um all the content that we've been provided and you know keep coming back to these videos if you have questions i think uh we're posting these for a reason so not just other people can can come in that, that may weren't able to join live but can come back later and review some of the things that Liam was was talking about earlier in terms of those criteria and some of the advice that he was giving so um always always use all the resources that we provide Oh, got another question coming in. All right. Um, I'll read it out. So it. Someone anonymous is asking, um, is it totally technical based? If our innovation is about building a prediction model for wildfire by analyzing different metrics and a lot of factors, which eventually gives a prediction of percentage of wildfire may occur in near real time, which can be a preventative me me measure. Um, this could be very impactful as we know before it starts to spread to many, many more areas. Um, that's a good question. I think, I think yeah. that's it. I'll, I'll, I'll let you speak on it. Liam. Go. Really? No, I, I was excited to hear what you had to say, Chad. I think um, this sounds great. I think, you know, is it totally technical based? I, you know, we are uh, an, a technical um, an innovation company. So we do look, we, as Liam mentioned earlier, we're not looking for just programs or projects. There does have to be a strong, you know, sort of technical advanced uh, scientific component to it. So, um, uh, and it sounds like analyzing these different metrics, that this, this prediction model, so it's like there might be a, a little AI uh, flavor in there as well. Um, that sounds like the type of thing that we're looking for. That does count as a, a technology to us. Um, so I think this this sounds sounds like a really good uh, uh you know, potential application. I totally agree with that, Chad. I think you explained it pretty well. And I think also um, anonymous attendee, I think you're hitting on it well and framing it well when you're talking about the impact at the end. Um, so it may be very technically interesting, uh, maybe very technically new, uh, maybe in an academic setting. Um, but if you can't really um, convincingly connect it to that end impact, then that's going to hamper your application a little bit. So you really want to make that clear connection to how your new approach or technology or solution or updated process is really going to be able to, to change what we're doing in the field right now and achieve a larger impact. So I think it, it sounds like you're right in line for a strong application as well. And we're excited to see that, that one too. All right. We'll give a couple more, a little more time for any last questions that may have come to mind from me and Chad's musings in the last few minutes. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you so much. 
All right. Well, I think that is our uh, webinar for today. Um, once again, please set up a meeting with me um, if you have any specific questions um, or feel free to reach out. And uh, this will be this video will be posted later on and emailed to you all. Um, so you will have the recording. You can refer back to this as well. Um, and so thank you for taking time out of your day to, to watch this. And thanks so much for the work you're doing for um, you know, the, the broader region and innovation in the space. And so uh, we're here because of you, and we're really excited about doing uh, the work that you're doing and, and seeing your applications. And so um, thank you so much for that as well. Thank you. Bye, everyone.